Sukuna is Hisoka on steroids. Just like probably the most iconic character in Hunter x Hunter. The King of Curses is loved for his charisma, is purely driven by his sadistic hedonism, and serves as a complete wild card in the story, helping both the heroes and the villains just as often as he likes to hurt or straight out ignore them, always looking for a way to benefit himself. <laughs> And yet, despite his cruelty, selfishness and darkness, just like the psychopathic clown, the King of Curses is as popular with fans as most of the quote-unquote good guys. So what exactly is it that makes Sukuna so fascinating to watch? As I've already mentioned in previous videos, Akutami loves taking popular tropes from anime and manga, merge them and improve on them. And so it comes as no big surprise that Sukuna emerges as one of the most rounded, complex and intriguing intriguing villains that I've ever come across. So let's discuss his background, his role in the story, his relationship to Itadori, Megumi and Gojo, and whether or not he truly is all evil. This is the story of Ryomen Sukuna. Sukuna is introduced in the story as the King of Curses, who lived over a thousand years ago in the golden age of Jujutsu in ancient Japan, where he was the most powerful being alive, despite being an actual human. As Akutami clarified in an interview, however, he wasn't so much curse user as natural calamity. Apparently, however, he still remembers his past life as a human quite well. After his death, however, he became a cursed spirit, so powerful that his body could not be destroyed but had to be divided into parts and sealed away. My god, this man Akutami really has a rich imagination to come up with something like... And I'm being told that this is actually all based on real Japanese history. So it's time for a short Japanese history lesson. It's time for Japanese history with Ryomen Sukuna. It's history. Because as it turns out, Ryomen Sukuna is actually a historic figure. Well, kind of. This person is mentioned in the second oldest record of Japan's history, the Nihon Shoki, completed in the 8th century AD. Admittedly though, parts of it cross heavily into mythology and Shinto religion, so it's often really impossible to separate legend from facts. In this book, however, that is filled with myths and politics alike, Sukuna is described as a demon-like person, significantly taller than any human, with two faces, two arms, and two legs. The epithet Ryomen, by the way, literally meaning two-faced. He's said to have appeared in Hida Prefecture, today's Gifu, that you can see on the map here. See, here's Tokyo, that by the way didn't exist back then, that, that's Gifu here. I mean, I don't want you finishing this video without having learned anything, right? Anyways. Here, Sukuna terrorized the people until a brave military commander was finally able to expel him from the land. Interestingly enough, however, while the Nihon Shoki describes him as a villain and an enemy of the emperor, people in Hida and Mino provinces treated Ryomen Sukuna as a hero and benefactor and actually worshipped him. And there is actually a shrine just dedicated to Sukuna that still exists in Gifu Prefecture today, with a statue that doesn't look quite as cool as this. <laughs> ah, bless anime. Now, since there's still very little that we know about him, I think the best way to understand Sukuna's character is by looking at the three most defining relationships so far that each give us a different perspective on his personality. These relationships are with Gojo, with Itadori, and Megumi, who has long been teased to play a central role in the story as well. <laughs> Now, as you might remember from my analysis of Gojo's character, there are a lot of parallels between these two. Being the two most self-centered and individualistic characters, both were introduced pretty much at the same time, right at the beginning of the story. One as the strongest sorcerer, and one as the king of curses. And the two of them clearly share this incredible aura of power, superiority and total control, especially during battle. 
So that. Hora, gambare, gambare. Next to their immense charisma, both of them also value strength over all else. In a way though, both are also incredibly immature and cruel, playing with other people and especially Sukuna, turning every single fight into some sort of game. Now, these parallels that Akutami clearly draws between these two characters strongly suggest that they will face off again at some point in the story. And yet, of course, there are also some striking differences between the two that I think will help us explain Sukuna's character a little bit better. The most fundamental difference here is, of course, that Gojo is a good guy and Sukuna is a baddie. But since we're dealing with a lot of morally gray and actually quite complex characters here, let's not be quite that superficial. The main moral difference between the two lies in their approach towards the central moral question of Jujutsu Kaisen. What constitutes a good life worth living? For Gojo, the answer here is strength itself. When you're strong, you can use that strength to shape the world as you please, which in Gojo's case means helping those he cares for. Sukuna's approach is actually quite similar. However, for him, a life worth living is the most extreme form of hedonism, as he uses his power to satisfy any of his desires, which often include the mental or physical tormentation of others. <laughs> Now, in this context, Gojo's self-confidence, always using his strength for the sake of others and trying to make a better world as he sees fit, are all good things. But the fact that he believes that no matter how strong he becomes, no matter how hard he fights, he'll always die alone because it's not worth becoming close to others in the Jujutsu world, is the real tragedy of his character. Sukuna, in contrast to this, either doesn't care or has reached a point of no return, having become numb to the world around him him and living purely for and relying only on himself. Same as with Hisoka, however, as modern neuroscience has found, hedonism and living out each and every one of your desires is anything but equal to being happy or being fulfilled. Instead, this sort of hedonistic lifestyle speaks for some sort of deep trauma in the past. Daniel Kahneman, an Israeli psychologist, introduced the concepts of the experiencing versus the remembering self. The experiencing self is the one that is experiencing the emotional state in the moment, like eating chocolate ice cream, or you know, tormenting the teenager you're stuck in. While the remembering self is the memory of the experienced moment looking back on it. Thus, for instance, while relaxing at the beach in some sort of resort is probably a lot more fun while you're actually there, exploring the history of Rome in the heat of summer may suck while you're there, but makes a way richer memory when thinking back to it. And bringing this concept all the way back to Sukuna. When someone is only living purely driven by the experiencing self, this usually means you prefer not to engage too much with your past and long-term consequences. And so what this tells us about the sadistic king of curses, who used to be human after all, is that he most likely had a quite tragic past that drove him into abandoning his humanity. And so unlike Mahito, who Akutami actually described as being pure evil by nature, I expect Sukuna to have a much more complex and rich background as to why he became as cruel and lust-driven as he has. And that will be one hell of a backstory for sure. Now, coming back to our comparison, while Gojo was pretty much born with ridiculous strength and perception, and thus was always used to having the upper hand in battle, Sukuna, despite his power, is surprisingly focused during all his battles. No matter if it's against Gojo or Megumi, he's always analyzing his opponent, trying to figure out exactly what's going on so he can counter as effectively and efficiently as possible. As he himself mentions, he appears to have an extremely deep and detailed understanding of what curses, cursed energy, and true jujutsu really are. And all of that would make a lot of sense, I think, if Sukuna had to struggle his way to the top from basically rock bottom. 
Now, one last important parallel between Gojo and Sukuna, in contrast to their individualism, is their approach to others. While they both prefer to rely on their own power, they also both long to understand those around them, even if it is for different reasons. In fact, Sukuna's one redeeming feature for now at least, is that when people are strong, he will acknowledge them and actually find them more interesting, as we can for example see with Megumi. But the takeaway message here is, is that Sukuna is so focused on strength in order to try and fill the emptiness inside him by satisfying his every desire. <laughs> Funnily enough, he shares that trait not only with Gojo, but also with the main character, Itadori Yuji. He is the third person who also thinks that power will help him live a good life by trying to save as many people as possible. And in regards to their relationship, Sukuna not only bears similarities to Hisoka, but also unites element from stories like Naruto, Bleach or Attack on Titan. In other words, the trope of the vessel. Just like Naruto and Eren, Itadori Yuji also serves as the container for a source of immeasurable destructive power that allows them to play way out of their league. However, while Eren's titan powers lack any personality in themselves, and Kuruma turns out to be a lonely, misunderstood and used creature that doesn't actually want to get involved with Naruto or his life, Sukuna is an actual evil person that constantly talks to Itadori and actively tries to harm him. And in that sense, I think that the closest and best comparison that we can draw is actually with Bleach. And by that I mean the good part of Bleach, and that is with Hichigo, Ichigo's dark self. <laughs> This dark self is an aspect of the self that is presented as an antagonist. Have you ever wondered, for example, why Sukuna looks so much like Yuji? We never see the face he originally had. He always specifically takes Itadori's form. As we know, while the part of Sukuna inside Itadori would perish if he were to die, the parts of his soul in the remaining fingers would nonetheless survive. So this specific Sukuna that we have met in a unique way seems to be tied to Itadori. Whenever Itadori can't control his darkest emotions like fear or anger, he starts to lose control over Sukuna. In other words, literally giving in to his own hedonistic instincts. <laughs> For example, once Itadori consciously acknowledges his anger towards Todo, he's finally able to deal with it in a more healthy way. And so just like Ichigo had to take control over his shadow self to use his powers, similarly it will be necessary for Itadori to take control over Sukuna, who as we now know only acknowledges strength in order to actually profit from his powers and keep him from hurting others, but most importantly himself. Because interestingly enough, the only person Sukuna is actually fixated on is not Itadori, whom he simply finds irritating, but Megumi Fushiguro. Oof. What a transition. Now, Fushiguro in himself is such a fantastic character that he deserves a video of his own, which will be the next one after this. Luckily, Sukuna is not exactly interested in Fushiguro for his personality, but of course, for his abilities. This connection between the two has been hinted at pretty much since their encounter during the Cursed Womb arc. And just to get it out of the way, of course Sukuna wants to use Fushiguro for his own purposes. Either I would guess to regain his own body, or to take on Gojo once he actually has it back. <laughs> Now, these statements here were of course triggers for both Megumi and the audience alike, but for different reasons. On the one hand, Sukuna's words show that he has an interest in Megumi and his ability, while giving the audience a more in-depth idea of Sukuna's taunful personality. On the other hand, however, they also actually help Fushiguro to grow, something that Sukuna keeps encouraging. In this moment here, for example, Megumi prepares to use what Gojo calls his trump card, an attack that is unconfirmed in nature, but seemingly is the end-all be-all for Megumi. 
And funnily enough, both him and Gojo have much more faith in his abilities than he himself seems to have. Now, whatever it is that he sees in Megumi, it seems to make it worth reviving Itadori and actually staying in his body, something he's not exactly enjoying. After all, Yuji being a one in a million potential vessel was a breaking point for Sukuna to once again feel human flesh, but we also know he doesn't want to stay in Yuji's body permanently. Why not? Well, after all, Yuji can control his possession and can become stronger as he absorbs more fingers. And should he die, the fingers within him would actually die as well. Unlike with curses, where the fingers would just reappear where the curse once was, as they cannot be destroyed by normal means. <laughs> And so I think it will be truly fascinating to see how Sukuna's plan with Fushiguro will play out, whether Itadori will be able to get his respect, and if we will ever get a true battle between him and Gojo. Oh, yeah, before we go, I wanted to shout out Aranyal Art, who did the wonderful intro animation for my Sukuna song.